Kuro Hyo Ryu ga Gotoku or Yakuza Black Panther or Kuroyo or just the first one on PSP was a game released on, well, PSP back at the end of 2010 and it was, as you can guess by my difficulty in pronouncing the name, only ever released in Japan. It was released after Yakuza 4 and before Yakuza Dead Souls. It got a TV show and some other weird stuff but after it came out it received nothing else besides its sequel a couple of years later. It was developed, in quotation marks, by RGG Studio but it was mostly made by a studio called Sin Sophia who are known for a small series called Def Jam as well as some other wrestling games. I bring that up because the game is like a hybrid between the Yakuza and Def Jam games. A lot of the animations from the Def Jam games are copied into this one, as well as some from the actual Yakuza games, but there are still a fair few things that were original. The game still has standard stuff of grabbing, hit actions, blocking, evading, as well as evade strikes, weapons you can grab off the floor like signs, and to top it all off, it's all in Kamurocho. Although it's a series of 2D images later on basic 3D geometry rather than full 3D Kamurocho that we're used to, but whatever. It's also permanently a night, likely because a whole daytime map would have just taken up unnecessary space. Then another similarity is that each combat encounter starts in the same way as Yakuza 1, 2 and Kenzan, where an enemy speaks to you, you go through a loading screen and then you fight in a designated combat area. Then the differences from the main game include uh, everything else. The camera is laid out like a 3D fighting game like Virtual Fighter, Tekken and Soul Calibur where it stays on the side of you and your opponent as opposed to the actual Yakuza games where the camera sticks behind you and is freely controllable. Rather than square being the light attack button and triangle being the heavy attack button, square is instead punch and triangle is kick. Also just like stuff like Tekken, your movement inputs can actually affect what attacks you do. There's no command inputs or anything like quarter circle roll punch, but it's just that if you want to do a big swing attack or an attack where you dash forward, you press left or right at the same time as the attack button. You can also hold down an attack, but unlike left and right, you just sort of do the same thing, but you aim lower. Your movement as well is locked to the camera, meaning left and right is back and forward, and then up and down is stepping left and right. But you can hold a button and move around freely, but I swear to god it's the most useless feature in any game I've ever played. Heat actions also function somewhat differently to the standard games. Rather than building up heat until you're in heat mode, then being able to do anything, you have three stages of heat which determine which heat action you do. You also have to grab your opponent, then press X, and the only other way to perform a heat action is if you have a friendly AI with you and they grab someone, then you press X near your mate. But anyway, there's the first level of heat with a blue aura, where you will do a basic heat action depending on which fighting style you have. No matter where you stand or what your health is or anything like that, you will always get the same heat action every time, as long as you're in blue heat. Next, there's the second stage of yellow heat, where you'll do a heat action based off of your environment. You don't actually have to stand near a wall or anything like that, but when doing a heat action in the early stage, regardless of whatever fighting style you have, you'll do something like slam a dude's head into the wall. Finally, there's the third stage, which is red and functions the same as the first stage, although you will now do a different and more powerful heat action. But what's this you hear about fighting styles? Well, the game doesn't have two or four fighting styles, but instead has 20. Unfortunately, they're not like the other games where they're all played differently, as they all pretty much behave the exact same way. They also can't be swapped too freely, like in Zero for example, and instead have to be swapped to the menu whenever you're outside of combat. The differences between the 20 of them include a few things, one of which being the different perks they provide. As you win fights, you gain XP like a traditional RPG, which then goes towards your overall level and the level of your currently equipped fighting style. As you level up your style, your combos increase, meaning that you can do more attacks before the final hit of a combo string, as well as the perks you have improving with each level. These range from stuff like increased damage with heat actions or faster grab speeds and so on. So for example, the boxing style gives you more damage with your punches, but less damage with your kicks. Beyond that though, some of the combo animations and heat actions are different between the styles, although some of them might have shared animations with another style. Therefore, the main factor you want to take into consideration when choosing what style you like is just what the combos are like and the perks that the style provides. There's also a unique damage system in this game where if certain body parts take too much damage, they'll become weaker and weaker. The parts are head, arms, torso, and legs. If I'm being completely honest, I never really could figure out exactly how this system works, but basically if you block too much or you get hit in the head too much, those respective parts will become injured. The same thing applies to the enemies, meaning that you can hit them in the same places and damage them in those places, but like I said, I would obliterate an enemy's head and then I'd hit them in the head and not really notice anything. How I believe it works is that, say for example you break your arms, you're much more likely to get staggered or stunned by getting hit in the arms, meaning that you're less effective at blocking. Then alongside this mechanic is the stamina mechanic, where the more out of breath you are from doing attacks, dodging or running around, the slower your attacks and grabs will become. You can also lose a lot of stamina when an enemy perfectly dodges your attack, but conversely, the enemy loses a lot of stamina if you do the same thing to them. Another thing that carries over from the player to the enemy is everything else. This game is quite unique in how you and the enemy both have the exact same tools as each other, including things like hit actions and the fact that the 20 fighting styles are also used by the various enemies of the game. However, you gain a leg up by being able to equip and use items, whereas specifically the bosses gain a leg up on you by being able to do these stupid dumb bullshit heat moves. Once a boss gets to a certain amount of health, you get a small cutscene, then they glow with a heat aura and will just spam attacks in your direction and you can't do anything about it but try to run away, and if you don't, you get hit with an extremely strong combo which will finish 
with a heat action. You can counteract it, but it's kind of bullshit sometimes, like how Tatsuya will just run into a wall because of the slightly awkward controls and then you get murdered. Speaking of enemy bullshit, the enemies will also catch all of your goddamn attacks. It's essentially parrying, but I do believe the game calls it catching. But anyway, the way it works is that you press the guard button and a moving button at the same time and you throw your hands up like this. Within a small window, if an enemy hits you anywhere with anything, you'll grab their attack and do a counter. Also, if an enemy hits you with a weapon, you'll actually take the weapon out of their hands and into yours. But I bring that mechanic up because in this game in particular, so not necessarily the sequel, I swear to Christ, like every enemy catches every attack. There's a boss in particular that intentionally catches all of your attacks because that's his whole gimmick, but you knock an enemy on the ground and they're all, oh, I've been defeated, only for them to just stand back up and parry you. Unfortunately, I did kind of find that the best way to fight enemies was just to grab them, throw them to the floor, then punch or kick them while they're down because there's genuinely nothing they can do about that. If it's a me issue, let me know because no matter what I tried, nothing proved more effective than just mashing the shit out of circle until you get heat and then you do a heat action. In relation to the bosses and their gimmicks, most of the bosses in the game all have their own unique gimmick. Some of them definitely add to the game, but others are just kind of yeah. For example, there's one fight where before the fight you damage your ankle. Your opponent then discovers this and during the fight will constantly attack your feet, which are now more prone to damage. Then some other ones include a fight where you can't hit a guy in the head too much or he will G, and so what that means is that some fighting styles can't use heat actions because all of them hit the opponent in the head, and you can't use a lot of specific regular attacks. But beyond the gimmicks, the boss fights are very fun and are probably the best part of the gameplay, which is saying a lot because the gameplay of this game is so goddamn fun and extremely satisfying. Even though some of the harder enemies will constantly give you the middle finger, it feels so satisfying when you do eventually smash their faces in. All of the visual effects whenever you land it hit just have so much impact and are both visually appealing and actually well designed for gameplay. Your health isn't displayed on screen unless you pause and your opponent's health isn't displayed anywhere at all, but you can tell what health you're at by the effects on the screen. When you hit 50%, your screen goes red, which is a bit annoying, but anyway, the health bar will also turn yellow. Once you reach critical health and the bar turns red, your character will actually keel over in pain, signifying to you that you better beat this dude's ass or heal right away unless you want to die. Blood will splatter on the side of the screen for whoever is taking damage, which is coupled with the camera shake and the impact effects that will give you a rough understanding of the damage you're dealing or receiving. A small attack won't do much, but a big fat Vade strike comes in and it's just like, BAM! That shit's so good. This game gets my goddamn blood pumping in a really good way. I just, I get so excited watching every punch land, even when they're landing on me. Like, seriously, even after doing the same punch over and over again, every time I just scream out, Shoot! But then there's the story, which is... You know, it's it's not that bad, actually. I will say that it gets distracted a lot, and weirdly, the final stretch of the plot is to do with this, like, side plot that sort of goes on in the background, which is a bit weird. The basic premise is that you play as a kid named Tatsuya Ukiyo, nicknamed the Mad Dragon of Komurocho, who's only 17 years old, as opposed to the typical 40s to 50s of most of the protagonists. He accidentally murders a guy in order to hide the murder from the police. A Yakuza family forces him to compete in an underground tournament known as Dragon Heat. Part of his deal with the Yakuza family is that if he beats the record of the highest win streak in Dragon Heat, meaning he'll have to win 10 fights in a row, he'll be set free with no repercussions whatsoever. So then his journey begins to go and beat the shit out of 10 specific people, but along the way he grows and becomes more mature, because at the start of the game he is your average 17 year old, i.e. a complete and utter evil little bit. The 10 opponents are the dudes that are on the front cover of the game behind Tatsuya, although I think one of the faces might be someone else, but I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell to be honest. These 10 opponents are unfortunately written exactly like episodic villains like you see in TV shows and manga, like you know how Jojo's Bizarre Adventure does all that all the time. So the game wastes a lot of time giving lengthy backstories to some of these dudes, only for everything to do with them getting resolved five seconds after you smash their faces in, and then most of the time you never hear anything about them ever again. I'm fine with them getting introductions, but some of them probably could have just been something like, hey, this dude's here to fight you, so that way the game could have dedicated more time to developing the more important characters. I like to think though that because of this, the story kind of goes like this. It's in a very straight line as it progresses towards your first and second opponents. Then it just kind of goes everywhere until you get to the tenth, and then it just sort of drops off after that as you go fight a pretty lame final boss who has like no real cool story impact, unlike the 10th Arena opponent. Besides that though, the game does actually have some very nice writing, and the cutscenes have a very cool looking style with a more animated comic book vibe similar to Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. But then there's my mate PS Resistance, that of course being the soundtrack of this game. It had two big name Yakuza composers that did some stuff on it, being Mitsuharu Fukuyama and Hidenori Shoji, although they only did a portion of the soundtrack. The rest was done by a handful of other composers, such as Wall 5, who ended up doing a couple more songs for the Yakuza game, like Nishiki's theme and Yakuza 0. Then this game was the first Yakuza Yakuza game that Hyde Lunch ever worked on, but that was back when he was a they, not because of gender or whatever, but because it used to literally be two guys. And finally, there was a dude named Skank Funk, although we all know him as either Hideki Nakanuma or the Family Guy Funny Moments guy. The soundtrack has so much passion in it, and I feel like the reasons why are right in front of you. Hyde Lunch poured their hearts and souls into the music of this game, and it was probably thanks to the fact that this was big boy Sega that they were working for, so they wanted to try their best. And good thing that they did, because then they ended up working on Yakuza Dead Souls and Yakuza 5. 
and Ishin and Zero, and Kiwami, and Six, and well, every game from then on. Also, fun fact, Hide Lunch have an extended version of the boss theme for the 10th Arena opponent on their SoundCloud, which I'll be sure to link in the description, or in the cards in the top right. Then there was Hideki Naganuma, who from what I gather, hated Sega, so it wouldn't surprise me if he had a brilliant idea to tell Sega to eat shit by going ham jabroni on the soundtrack of a PSP spin-off game. Honestly though, this entire game screams of passion, and it's so unfortunate that it never was on any home consoles, and it's almost guaranteed that this game and its sequel will never see any re-releases of of any description. And you know, for a time I kind of thought that maybe Sin Sophia went out of business, but nah, they're actually still making games like Fashion Dreamer for the Switch. Oh no. Oh, Sin Sophia, what happened to you? If you do want to play Kuroyo, you have three options. You can buy the game physically and chuck it onto your PSP, and then that's actually it, Sega. There's no other way to play the game, so listening, Sega, go away. All right, now that Sega stopped listening, the other two options are that you emulate it with a PSP emulator on your computer or something, or you homebrew a PS Vita and play it that way. In my opinion, the worst way to play it is on a PSP because most of your battery will, no joke, get drained by the long cutscenes because they're still rendered in real time, so it's not like your PSP is just playing a video. Low times, from what I've experienced at least, are also far slower on a PSP than either of the other two options. There's also the odd frame rate drop on a PSP as opposed to the other two options where it seems to run perfectly fine. Also, the gameplay is 60 FPS, but when you do a heat action it locks it to 30. So no, your game isn't lagging, it just does that. Another thing to consider is that the game is obviously in Japanese and there does currently exist an English patch that is unfinished, but pretty soon there will be one that is complete. Then there's also quite a good guide for the game on GameFAQs, so you know. All in all, I would honestly recommend this game to anyone. If you don't own a PSP nor are you interested in any PSP games or emulating them or whatever, I probably wouldn't recommend it. But, you know, let's say if someone's like, hey, what are some good PSP games? I'd tell them this and the second game, and then that'd be it, because Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep is ass. Why did I platinum it? If you enjoyed the video, rather than smacking the like button, you should instead sidestep evade strike the like button as hard as possible. Then grab spam the subscribe button and run out of batteries before you join the channel and become a member and lose the last hour of your save file because the cutscenes are longer than this video. Now then, I hope you look forward to the next video where I'll be talking about Yakuza Dead Souls, the other black sheep of the franchise.